action. Start out with any questions. We've done a rotation. We've done one rotational motion. We're going to get to uh, another classic type. But first, we need to talk about gravitational force. So up till now, all the gravitational forces we've worked with have dealt with weight. You see what it means. This is obviously. You know, this is rather convenient if you're near the surface of a planet. However, what is the gravitational force between the Earth and the Sun? Well, if you know what the acceleration due to the gravitational force is for the Earth, you could do it. But we don't know that. Because we know the acceleration of small objects near the Earth, we don't know the acceleration of the Earth itself. So we need a more generalized formula. So what would you expect that force due to gravity to depend on? Or on what would you expect the force due to gravity to depend on? The mass of an object. Okay. There's several things right there. Uh, so the mass relative to something else. Do when we when we figure out the weight of us, do we consider our mass relative to something else? In what, in what sense? I, as I mean, it's specific to the, in this case, the planet that you're standing on. And the scale is not only incorporating your mass, but the like, effect of gravity on your body. Right. When you said relative to another object, you're talking about relative position-wise or relative mass-wise? I feel like it could be either or both. I mean, if you're thinking about the, the Earth and the Sun, it's both how far away they are from each other at any given time and also the mass of yeah, and that it does depend on the mass of each of them. So there are two masses involved. So we'll put both of them in there. And in terms of distance, is your gut feeling that the closer objects are or the farther objects are will give you a stronger force? Yes. Closer. Okay. <laughs> I didn't touch anything. He got it. I maybe breathed on it. Oh, but it's still recording. Well, oh, absolutely. You'll be able to figure it out when you watch it. All you hear is the phone calling, Jacob! <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see how that holds. That was odd. I guess I didn't have it in there securely enough. So anyway, where I was. Uh, it was actually a, there was a choice there, the, although yes, technically, is a correct answer. Uh, what were you saying before? I would say closer. It seems like it'd be a stronger force. Okay, so as the distance gets smaller, the force gets bigger, and so R would go on the bottom, the distance. And I'm not going to justify it, but it turns out to be an R squared relationship. Originally found experimentally in, by Cavendish in the late 1700s. I guess he found it experimentally. Uh, I believe Newton had it, theoretically. Now, the question, there has been a question in some physics circles whether it really is squared or is it maybe 2.01 or 2.0001. And there have been experiments to try to figure out what that the exponent of the denominator is and 
what you'll find is the difference between two and our experimental value is less than, and then they'll give some tiny number. Now notice that I did leave a gap up front here, and that basically deals with what unit system you're working in. Because as it is, this would, in SI units, this would be kilograms squared on top, meters squared on the bottom, and we need to somehow get to newtons. And so they represent this by the capital G, sometimes just stuck into the numerator as opposed to up front. And this is known as the gravitational constant. If you look at older textbooks, uh, they'll, or older sources, I guess potentially some newer sources, depending upon who's writing it, sometimes it's referred to as the universal gravitational constant. However, there is a question of whether it's truly really universal or whether this, the value that we have is true for just our local area. But the value is approximately 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th Newton meter squared or kilogram squared. That's a G. That is the capital G there. This is off topic, but it goes back to what you were saying earlier. So if two objects are closer together, the force is actually stronger? Yes. Okay. So let's get a, a, at least a general sense of gravitational force here. We can now find gravitational forces between any two masses. So the gravitational force between me and, uh, let's say that pad of paper right there, or the, the ream of paper, the force due to gravity, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. Uh, first time we'll do units, meter squared per kilogram squared times my mass, which is about 100 kilograms, times the mass of the paper. Oh, here we go, no. That is a surface density. I thought you were picking it up and like guessing the weight yourself, and then I realized you were not Yeah, no. I'm horrible at that. Uh, one kilogram. Oh, let's make it two just for some variety. Divided by the distance between us, and I'm just gonna estimate that at, that's about 1.7 meters. Squared. If someone be kind enough to work through the, that on the calculator. Kilogram squared cancels out with these kilograms. The meter squared cancels out with that meter squared. Okay, yeah, that's why we use a constant. Okay. Yeah. So this is why when we do the formal force diagrams, the, the more complicated force diagrams, we ignore these kind of forces because the forces between the smaller objects is only order of a billionth of a newton. So they are easily ignored. The only people who care about these forces are ones who are actually doing gravitational experiments. You know, the people who are trying to figure out, is that really a square? So 
So if we do Earth and Sun, the gravitational force between Earth and Sun really should not be called weight. So that's why I'm using this symbol here. It's going to be 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 times mass of the Earth, 5.98 times 10 to the 24 times mass of the Sun. I'm going to double check this in just a second. 1.99 times 10 to the 31st divided by that distance, which I definitely have to look up. Now, typically in a physics textbook, the, this type of information is either going to be on the front cover or the back cover. And on this one, it's in the back. Let's see, mass of sun, oops, 10 to the 30th. And orbiting radius for Earth, 1.5 times 10 to the 11th square. Make sure. Uh, they have 5.97, so let's just go with that one. Got the same thing. We got one support back there. Then uh, to get that four point six, uh, would you put hundred for m? That's uh, hundred squared times. Uh, Newton divided by four. Did you did you do that? Or? How do you get the four point six? I mean, it says m squared times n divided by. Oh, that's that's meter squared. These are units. Uh, so that's not mass squared. Okay. So. So it, it's, it well, it's just point? it's that the six point six seven times ten to the negative eleventh times one hundred times two right. divided by one point seven squared. I also got the 3.5. Alright, so we got three people, four people, five. It's a ground swell. Alright, so that seems like a whole lot of force there, but again, the Earth is massive. So, what is the acceleration of the Earth going around the Sun? Well, I know F is equal to MA. And so we can find the magnitude of the acceleration 3.5 times 10 to the 22nd. Newtons divided by the mass of the Earth, 5.97 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. You have 5.86. 5.86, um, like, times 10 to the 12. Right? Times 10 to the negative third? Yeah. That would make more sense. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. I didn't put parentheses in. That was a mistake there. Because you got 10 to the 22nd over 10 to the 24th, and right there, that's a 10 to the negative 2. That give you, that's less than 1, so putting the scientific, oh, it yeah. give you a negative 3 here. All right. Units? Meters per second squared. So that's the acceleration due to the gravitational force from the sun. Now, for the most part, this is a centripetal force, which connects it with the stuff that we were just doing. And notice also, we got the force with the mass of the Earth in it, and then we divided by the mass of the Earth. So we could make it go a little bit more generalized there, is the fact that 
I can use mg as long as I know what little g is here. So in this particular case, this would be big G, mass of sun, mass of earth, over the orbital radius of the sun, earth, or earth, sun, squared, is equal to mass of earth times little g. Mass of earth cancels out, and I now have a formula for little g. Or making it more generalized, the acceleration due to gravity is equal to big G times mass of the central object divided by the orbital radius squared. So um, for the acceleration, why didn't we use the, the mass of this smaller one? Like, like, is there a special reason why we chose the 5.97? Because I was looking at the acceleration of the Earth going around the sun. So we could have looked at the acceleration of the sun itself because of the Earth, and that would be even tinier. But the question was, what was the acceleration of the Earth? So, you, so this would be mass of the Earth, since that's acceleration of the Earth. And that first, um, so, 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 so the 5.97, that was the mass of the Earth? Yes. And then, so then what was the two? The two times 10 to the 30. Uh, that's the mass of the sun. Oh, okay. Yeah. Does this mean every year is shorter than the last? Oh, because there's acceleration? Yeah. No, if, you, if this is, if it truly were a circular orbit, then this would be the acceleration because of change in direction. Oh, okay. It's an and ellipses. mostly it's not all, but yeah. It's an ellipses, isn't it? That's why we have seasons. Uh, the the ellipses is not the cause for the seasons. It's the tilt of the Earth that's the cause for oh. the seasons. Yeah. Then what's the one point five? That is the orbital radius of the Earth. That's the, roughly the distance from Earth to Sun. 1 astronomical unit. So we're we're saying that this is like a circular orbit not an ellipses, right? Right. Okay. If we were if we were to have an ellipses, would we just try and find the I no, I keep going back to this, but I'm just curious. Like, would we would we find the distance between both and then just average them, both radiuses? No. Um, going to go back. If you go actually onto on the blackboard under coursework chapter six, there's a series of how you actually handle elliptical orbits. Okay. And. Basically, it's it's heavily calculus based, yeah. And I, I'm deriving Kepler's laws. <laughs> okay. I think there's seven videos there because I had to break it up into smaller segments. Uh, also, the proper treatment of it, you also have to somehow account for the fact that the sun is moving because of the Earth, because they're being pulled towards each other. Yeah. And so it takes into account the wobble of the sun. How much realism do you want at this point? <laughs> I shouldn't have asked. <laughs> no, I mean, it, if nothing else, it, it exposes again the fact that we're just touching the surface here. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine breaking it up by atoms or something like that. Well, that's why you have supercomputers. Yeah. And there are people, there is computational physics where they do try to get into that level of detail of can we start predicting based upon where atoms are within a structure. Yeah. But I mean, doesn't that kind of contradict their their work? Because atoms have like electrons constantly moving around them, don't they? Or am I thinking of uh, around them or in them or yeah. wherever electrons happen to be. Yeah. So wouldn't that just throw off a lot of calculations? You'd have to like individually think of each atom as its own thing? It gets incredibly complicated. Yeah. And that that's why there's a specialty on it, of trying to deal with it. Uh, I never got into that level. Yeah. Although 
certain fascination with, with being able to make predictions starting at a very small level there and work your way up. But I was at a larger level than that so that I didn't have to, I didn't have to worry about that kind of stuff. Yeah. Actually, I wasn't dealing with atoms, I was dealing with individual particles. Oh, wow. You probably want to ignore the electrons in your calculations for the most part anyways, because most of the mass is in the nucleus. If you're looking at gravitational forces, yes, and if you start looking at electric forces, then yeah, yeah that's really good. Math. <laughs> and then at that point, you have to take into consideration statistics. Yeah, it, it just gets way complicated way fast. Yeah. So you pick the level of physics that is not going to drive you insane. <laughs> Is that quantum physics the one that's going to drive you insane? Parts of it. Okay. There's a video that I came across recently. Uh, ele physics explained or reality explained. In, yeah. In an elevator trip. Is, have I mentioned it before? I don't. I don't think so. You seen it? Uh, I've seen something about an experiment they did with something else, but it was about particles like passing through two channels, and they oh. actually split up, and the electron just randomly like hits on a sign or a, a wave pattern you know what i mean no oh, yeah oh yeah the double slit yeah yeah, yeah that is mind-boggling they set an electron and you don't observe which slit it goes through it goes through both yeah well that was one theory and then the other one was i think it's like predetermined but we just don't know it until we observe it yeah it functions in both ways until it's observed yeah it um, and there's some experiments which sort of counter the predetermined yeah viewpoint. Yeah, so but that's for the, the end of next semester. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's take a look at I have some central object here, which I'm going to cleverly label C. I have some orbiting object that I'm going to just label S for satellite. I am going to assume a circular orbit. So that we don't have to worry about calculus. Let's do a force diagram of the satellite. What are all the forces acting on it? Gravity. 